Well, welcome to our Insight Series, conversations to bring new and compelling perspectives on issues of critical importance to key stakeholders and the patient community. These conversations are hosted by the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association and Let My Doctors Decide. ARDA is dedicated to the eradication of autoimmune diseases through education and public awareness, research and patient services. And one of ARDA's key initiatives is a national awareness campaign called Let My Doctors Decide. This is a national partnership of leaders across the healthcare community working in support of one simple goal. Treatment decisions should always be made by patients and trusted healthcare professionals, not insurance companies or pharmacy benefit managers. Now we're honored today to be speaking with Dr. Madeline Feldman, one of the leading rheumatologists and patient advocates who works tirelessly to raise awareness about issues and policies that are critical to providers and patients. Dr. Feldman is president of the Coalition for State Rheumatology Associations, CSRO, and chair of the Alliance for Safe Biologic Medicines. Dr. Feldman is a clinical assistant professor of medicine at Tulane University School of Medicine. She's a well-known subject matter expert and sought after speaker at national and state forums. We frequently see Dr. Feldman's byline in national newspapers and in leading healthcare publications on a variety of issues, including access restrictions, pricing, and affordability issues. Dr. Feldman, thank you so much for joining us today. You know I'm a big fan, and I think your voice, your perspective could not be more critical to the work that we do. Well, thank you for having me here, Randy. I'm a fan of yours and Arda as well. It's uh, it's wonderful to have partners um, like Arda in this, I hate to use the word fight, but it's, you know, fight for our patients to have access to the right medicine at the right time. Absolutely. And right in, in, in a challenging environment, you know, patients trying to manage a chronic health condition, sometimes multiple conditions um, in the mix of daily life is never easy. And then now, and we'll talk about it, um, comes a pandemic and other kinds of issues in turning the economy, things that really challenge families, households, and these patients themselves and their providers to make the right decisions and then look to the system to support them in those decisions. Not to fight them in those decisions. <laughs> Absolutely, exactly. I say support, it's like, could we at least get to that point? Right. But, you know, first, tell us a little bit about your practice, the kinds of patients that you're seeing, you know, what gives you, you know, hope for the future as you talk to them about just what we were talking about, managing their conditions to lead the lives that are most important to them. Well, I'm a, a, I've been a rheumatologist in private practice here in New Orleans, where I'm from. I'm a, a native, as they say, um, since 1988. Uh, I'm sort of the old lady in the crowd, and we're a small, a small practice. They, I have uh, two younger partners who finished their fellowships all within the last five or six years. Um, the older partner retired in January, so yes, I've taken on the the moniker of the old lady in the group. You know, um, I think one of the things that really gives me hope is I'm I'm now in that group of rheumatologists that that actually when I went out in practice in 1988, that was the year that the FDA approved methotrexate for the use in rheumatoid arthritis. So I, I actually was in the, you know, I didn't go back as far as take 14 aspirin a day, um, but I did, you know, I was, I gave a lot of gold shots and penicillamine and Plaquenil were our only, um, you know, only quivers, only arrows in our quiver. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think the hope is really there because what I've seen, you know, it, in the last 10 years, the amount of innovation and the amount of medications that are in the pipeline that really bring our, our patients to, you know, a state of remission that we had never hoped for, you know, 15, even 20 years ago. So I, I do have a lot of hope for the future. And I just hope that my kind of practice, that small private practice, um, you know, doesn't go away because, you know, I, I I think patients really like feeling like they're in someone's home. And I think that's what they feel like when they come to our office. Well, that, that's great. I mean, I would think that that just brings the stress level down, you know, their ability to trust and interact in a calm way to listen better in those kinds of settings has to make a difference for them and their health ultimately. But, you know, you, you've been one of the leading voices, you just touched on it a little, one of the leading voices, one of the most passionate advocates on reforming access restrictions, including step therapy, 
prior authorization, something called rebate walls, you know, other harmful practices that get in the way of patients' abilities to really get the much needed best medicines for them as prescribed by their doctors. So what motivated you to get involved in that space? And are you seeing any indications that we're making progress, that these concerns that we share, ARDA and CSRO and the other organizations you're involved in, are very aligned in trying to um, raise awareness and um, develop that level of compassion and support uh, concerning these barriers. What, tell me a little bit about that. What are you seeing, you know, are our concerns being heard? You know, I, when, when you say, how did I get involved in this? You know, there's a, there's the short story and the, not the longer story, but the one that goes back further back in the seventies, you know, when my mom was in her early fifties, she got lung cancer mm -hmm. and I had just started college and um, late seventies, I guess. And I would take her for radiation and chemotherapy. And back then, believe it or not, they wouldn't give patients um, pain medicine because they were fear that they would get addicted to it. Now that was a lack of access to the right medicine because of ignorance at the time. It really was just ignorance. However, now we see that our patients don't get access to the right medicine, not out of ignorance, but unfortunately out of greed. And those are two completely different, you know, uh, ball games right there. About eight years ago, and this all sort of started with drug pricing, eight or nine years ago when the first JAK inhibitor came on the market, um, you know, everybody, it's organizations, you know, pharma companies that are coming out with new drugs want to tell you about them. And when we heard about that first JAK inhibitor, we said, great, it's oral, it's a new mechanism of action, price it right. And, you know, it will get used because by then the biologics, the prices were going higher and higher and higher. And lo and behold, they came out and priced it the same as a biologic. And when I, you know, when I've had the first uh, pharmaceutical representative come in my office after it was launched at this high, high price, I said, why did you do that? Why did, why did you have to price it so high? And he really didn't know. He all I know is that we have to price it high enough. And that sort of led me and then consequently CSRO down this path of trying to figure out why was it important to price your drug higher? We always thought that the lower you were, the more competitive you would be. And that's what led us to pharmacy benefit managers and formulary construction and rebate walls. And, you know, and as I said, I think that, you know, un unfortunately, the lack of access, whether it's not on the formulary or whether it costs too much or the coinsurance is too high or an accumulator program is in there, the, the bottom line for that is someone's shareholders, and that should not be. Um, in spite of the two Goliaths, I mean, you know, we're, we're really fighting very large groups. When I say fighting, I mean, we're working with the manufacturers. They, mm -hmm. they make the drugs, but they price them. And then we've got the group that says, what can we take and how much are you going to pay for it? Um, those are very powerful, but in spite of how powerful they are, I think the word is getting out and I do have hope for the future that we're making a dent, um, the support we've given. And I know we're going to talk about that, that, that Supreme court case. that's right. going to be coming up. So yes, I, I think that our word has been heard from the, from, from the very local level, all the way up to, um, Congress and the administration. Well, that's encouraging. And I know, again, we're partners in that conversation. Why don't we just um, talk a little bit about that Supreme Court case? So it's a landmark healthcare case. It's pending in the Supreme Court. I believe it came out of Arkansas, if I'm not mistaken. It's going to determine the extent to which states can regulate the middleman. And in, in this case, we're talking about pharmacy benefit man, uh, managers. So to ensure that patients can make choices when it comes to their health care, that reimbursement policies at the pharmacy support them. What are your thoughts about that particular case? Why is it so important? Because I know the organizations you're involved in have really been um, speaking out in, in support. I think an amicus brief was filed, but then also making sure that all of us collectively are aware of this decision coming down the pike. Why is it important? And what do you see happening um, as that decision is made? So a little background on it, um, you know, the attorney general in Arkansas, Leslie Rutledge, um, after a law was passed that actually had to do with pharmacists mm -hmm. and cost of drugs and sort of regulating how PBMs treated phar pharmacists. And they passed the law and um, PCMA basically came in and filed a lawsuit and said, well, you can't 
you, you can't have jurisdiction over these self-funded large employers. And that's sort of where it started because when states pass laws, they only have jurisdiction over the state groups or the, 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 the totally insured, not the self-funded. So there was this large group of patients that were not getting the benefit of those protections. And um, so they've gone through actually a circuit court and another court, and um, and it goes before the Supreme Court. And the importance of this is, and, and whether it goes either way, there's gonna be some precedents. And if it goes our way, meaning that Rutledge, the attorney general in Arkansas, mm -hmm. comes out on top with the Supreme Court, it, it then throws open the door for all of that kind of legislation that oversees the, the utilization management tools, like you know whether it's prior authorization, right. step therapy, non-medical switching, accumulator adjustment programs, all of those things. Evidently, it has to do with cost. And if mm -hmm. it has to do with cost, then the, the, you know, the decision will allow states to, um, and to have jurisdiction over those large self-funded employer groups. I can tell you PCMA, which is the trade group right. that, 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 that Rutledge is essentially, essentially uh, going against in this case, they represent the, the large PBMs mm -hmm. and they are powerful. I don't want to jinx anything, but you know, mm -hmm. I have this feeling that there is a, there's a good chance that, that we may come out on top. You know, it's essentially taking over um, ERISA, you know, and the ERISA is right. the one that handles those. And, you know, I look at the, the, the ads from, from PCMA um, on Twitter and social media, and they are just saying, oh, this, this will erode the protections of ERISA and employers, you don't want to lose those protections on and on and on. Actually, what, is, what it does is add even more protections right. for the employees. It doesn't degrade the protections. What it does is expose and make more transparent the shenanigans, and I'm going to just go ahead and call them shenanigans or right. egregious behavior of these middlemen. And anytime you do that, watch out, it, it touches their bottom line and they're going to threaten, as they always do, to raise premiums and increase cost share. Well, I so appreciate you being on top of this issue and being active. I mean, it's a really big deal to see this case move forward, as you suggested. I mean, the complexity that exists now in our healthcare system, perhaps some of it is absolutely necessary. A lot of it gets a little hard to figure out when it comes down to um, the cost, the affordability, the access, and the ability of patients to adhere to that regimen that their physician you know, prescribes for them. And I think those ERISA plans, those self-insured plans, which represent a huge number of people working for uh, companies that are nationwide in scope, um, that, you know, those individuals have really been in a loss. Do you get a sense that this is helping to educate the employers? Because, you know, in those, in, in those instances, they may or may not really understand, you know, the decision they make to please keep costs down by X in terms of one plan year to the next. And then what's actually available to their employees? Do you think that's? Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I started giving lectures, you know, to get some of the small business owners and started actually going to some rotary clubs and giving mm -hmm. lectures. I had a, I, I talked about formulary construction, non-medical switching, exclusions from formularies and why they're done. And it's for essentially for profit. Right. And I had a small business owner come up to me afterwards and she said, I finally understand what, what happened and why. She goes, I have signed the same health plan agreement for the last five years. Yes. And there was no changes. My broker told me there was no changes. You just sign this. And she said, and I have atrial fibrillation and I've been able to get the drug. She's keeping me out of AFib for the last five years. This year, that drug is no longer on the formulary. I've, my cardiologist had to put me on two different drugs. I've been in and out of AFib. I actually went into the hospital for a cardioversion. Wow. And it's all, and she thought she had signed the exact same plan. Sure. So I don't even, I'm not even sure if it's a question of misunderstanding. It actually, it, in some cases, may be a question of being misleading the employers. Yeah. You know, so many of these things are on, you know, page 68 of the brochure, and okay. they just conveniently forget to say that. Oh, by the way, we can just take off whatever drugs you've been on. 
And, um, but don't worry, you're signing the same health plan. Exactly. Well, then this really does create an opportunity to help raise awareness and bring that education forward. And, you know, for the people that you see, the people we represent, people with chronic conditions, oftentimes multiple chronic conditions, um, you know, how those plans are designed, how those formulas, formularies are constructed, giving physicians and those patients some options if something's not working well for them or they develop you know, whatever, um, whatever the rationale might be to look at a different medication, you want that to be available to them. Absolutely. And, and I would hope that employers ultimately want, you know, employees to be productive and healthy uh, in their charge in their workplace. So, well, thank you for that. That's helpful. And it kind of leads into, you know, the other player here are the states that are making those decisions. You know, they're charged with overseeing the plans that are offered in their states. Um, there is that level of complexity. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, you know, CSRO and the work that you've been doing in some ways, this uh, Arkansas case is a reflection of that, but, you know, governors, state insurance commissioners, state legislators across the country uh, have got to be overwhelmed with different messaging around the complications. And yet, you know, how can we help them understand that patients together with their physicians are very cost conscious for one thing, and very much just want to um, improve their health with oftentimes help society and certainly their families um, save money in the long run. So what's happening in states and how can we collectively uh, help support states in making the right decisions? Well, you know, you're absolutely right. Before I get into answering that yeah. specific question, uh -huh. I, I, you know, these these legislators, some of them are pretty savvy, even though many of them are car salesmen and sure. electricians, you know, they're not doctors, right. not all. In fact, there's very few doctors. Right. Um, I remember one, there was a, 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 a sort of a transparency law, I believe that was being passed in California and an assemblyman was, he was the, he was dropping this bill. And he said, all of a sudden his, his office was inundated with express scripts and CVS Caremark and OptumRx and everybody was coming in. And he said, he knew then that he was onto something right. <laughs> When right. All these people kept in, kept coming in. So, you know, right. they, they they are getting inundated from both sides. But I tell you, CSRO, we've been so fortunate to be able to be part of sort of this ever growing conglomerate of patient and, and provider advocacy groups like, you know, like ARDA, Let My Doctor right. Decide, and uh, working together in, in so many states. And it, it truly has made a difference. You know, um, this year, uh, CSRO did come down into Louisiana and help us pass a very sort of a redo, a, a third redo of our step therapy bill. And we've really sort of tightened up the exceptions and it's and it's and it's made a big difference. Um, you know, in the in the coming years, it looks like we're we're in alphabetical order. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Arizona, Arkansas, Illinois, Louisiana, and Missouri. And, you know, and whether it's a utilization management, sort of um, non-medical switching, mm -hmm. I think there are maybe 22 states that are going to be proposing some accumulator bans, which is right. really, really important. And, you know, and working and, you know, and we love working with you guys. And if you've got, you know, resources or patient advocates in one state or another that are, you know, that are important, even in those states, maybe where we're not going to be looking mm -hmm. at passing any bills, you know, it's that, it's that networking and getting the strength there um, in the, in the grassroots that really makes a difference. Having patients come in, or, you know, it's, it's important to have a provider give that aspect as opposed mm -hmm. to maybe a lobbyist or something, but having a patient come in and give their stories is by far the most important um, uh, part of the committee and, uh, you know, of the, of the house or the Senate. Absolutely. Well, it is. And, you know, those first person testimonials, and these are neighbors, these are constituents, you know, these are people like themselves. And I think it really makes a point. One of the things that ARDA has evolved in doing particularly well, particularly now in these, these days, is using social media to really help reach people, both decision makers, as well as people affected by these decisions, give them information and an avenue then to weigh in and we're seeing legislators, their staff, others um, pay attention to the kind of feedback and the kind of stories that are coming through. So in talking to CSRO and some of the partner groups, one of the things we'll be contributing in this year ahead in those states you just mentioned is really providing that social media acumen. 
um, as a way of helping to inform and engage patients and physicians and others, you know, the, the, the practice nurses. I know when rheumatologists work very closely with the National Organization of Rheumatology uh, Managers, NORM, um, yeah. they're on the front lines with all of us and they have a compelling story to tell. So uh, know that we've, we've made that commitment, which, you know, is particularly important now because people aren't doing advocacy days or aren't, aren't interacting with their legislators at the state level or the federal level the way we used to. Mm -hmm. what, what are you seeing? I mean, you're seeing patients that are probably still very concerned about the pandemic and COVID-19. Um, what are you learning now that we're, you know, six and plus months in? And what are you saying to those patients about coming back into society, um, you know, feeling comfortable anticipating perhaps the time when a vaccine might be available. You know, how are, how are we putting those patients first in a very challenging environment? It is, you're absolutely right. You know, even without the pandemic, being a patient, you're in a very vulnerable position. You, you're, you're unsure of, are you gonna get better? Is this something that's gonna last forever? Is this something I can, uh, you know, transmit to future generations? Mm -hmm. So there's this feeling of vulnerability. And I think one of the things that has come out over the last few years that has been really important has been the idea of empathy. Um, I had a, I had a, a sort of a, a health issue. It was a really, it was a, actually I had a skin cancer and mm -hmm. they told me I might need a forehead flap, which is a very, you know, involved, big procedure. And I, I made a phone call to the, I can't remember whether it was the Mohs surgeon or the plastic surgeon. I just mm -hmm. sort of blocked the whole thing out and his nurse wouldn't let me talk to him. And I just said, I have one question. She says, well, can you tell me the question? And I said, well, I, no, I'd like to talk to him. I'll make an appointment. He did eventually call me back, call mm -hmm. me back. And we learned, I tell you, as a physician, I learned something every day. And what I learned when he called me back, there was something in his voice that I could tell he didn't want to talk to me. And I think the light bulb was, I recognized that that was in my voice sometimes. Uh, and I don't know if my patients picked up, but I learned a huge lesson. I actually wrote something about it and it got put on room now. And it's the kind of that kind of thing where the patient really is the most important, you know, regardless of how you're feeling that day and the pandemic. And one of the things that we're all looking for in our lives is consistent consistency and stability. Right. So you've got a chronic illness and now you've got this. COVID-19 thing going around. You don't know if you're going to catch it. You don't know if you're going to die. People look to, they look to me, not necessarily to, to cure them or to mm -hmm. prevent them from getting COVID-19, but to acknowledge their fear and what, and, and ask, what are your concerns? Not like, did you have fever right now? Right. What are you worried about? And I think that's one of the most important things that allows us to be patient centric is to really understand and it may not even have anything to do with the you know with their rheumatoid arthritis or their lupus or the or covid but they're concerned that their life isn't going to be the same or they're worried they're going to you know their husband's going to lose their job those are the kind of things that have i think have, have made it crystal clear where the real importance of of whether you want to call it the art of medicine or where our focus should be in addition of course to the you know the kind of treatments and development and those kind of, of things course, you know, I think that so speaks highly of you and a lot of your colleagues, you know, that are on the front lines is you're seeing the whole person and you do your best in the mix of, you know, an incredible schedule. And, you know, you would have more time for patients, I would argue, if you didn't have to do the prior authorizations, all of the exceptions process, so many of the barriers we were just talking about actually come between you and your patient in terms of being able to have time for them, which is crazy. And, um, and yet patients, like anyone, just wants that reassurance from someone that they trust who has the bigger picture. You're seeing other people like them navigate, you know, not just their conditions, but also the current circumstances. And that's hugely reassuring. Uh, we, we've started to do, a, it's going to be quarterly at least, and it's called Managing Stress, Promoting Health and Well-Being, you know, um, just generally with a chronic condition, with an autoimmune disease. And now we've added in the midst of a pandemic. And then, and then we're looking at kind of those aspects of that. And I'm sure you see this in your practice. The, the one that we have later this week is gonna also then say with the added component of chronic pain uh, or with the added component of perhaps mental illness. 
in mental health challenges. And these things are so interrelated for our patients. And it sounds to me, I know this of you, where you look at the whole person and in the context of their lives and to be able to just speak to them honestly, talk to them about the medical part, but then do that in a way that they see that you see them has got to be very curative, I think, very reassuring for them. You know, it's 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 funny. I, you know, years ago when we just had methotrexate or right before some mm -hmm. of the biologics, I remember one of the physicians that would refer to me. He goes, "I don't know what you do with the patients, but each time they come to you, mm -hmm. they, well, they they say they feel much better." And <laughs> maybe I increase their methotrexate by one pill or right. something that and you know i started learning just from feedback from the other physicians to tell me how they're that 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 sometimes it's not just the pill in right. fact a lot of times yeah. it's not just the pill well, you know dr feldman i always feel better coming coming away from a conversation with you <laughs> and let the record show you've never actually prescribed something that i had to go a prescription to get filled but you, by virtue of who you are, the energy you bring to your relationships, I would argue with anyone, um, but certainly with your patients. But I also think that makes you a more effective advocate with legislators and others. There's a genuineness as well as the intelligence um, and the experience that you bring forward that I think is, is really unique. And so, you no, know, it's, it's really true. Coming from you, that is a very high compliment. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and I do want to tell you, y'all's use of the um, social media platforms is excellent. The educational things that mm -hmm. you put out, uh, let my doctor decide, all, all of those things have been so helpful. And actually, I've used them in some of my testimony. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And more to come. We realized I, I always saw that as kind of an ancillary component. But in these days, and perhaps going forward, now that we've really gotten comfortable with um, what can be done in those channels. Um, stay tuned because I think there'll be a lot more, but we'll be evolving those programs, those tools, those messages in conjunction with you, CSRO, our other partners. Um, I can't tell you how impressed I am by you. As I said, your, your passion, your compassion, your um, readiness to take on these issues, which are very complex. I don't know if sleep is a part of your daily equation. I can't imagine when you're learning about all of these things, but um, just count on Arda, count on our, our colleagues. You know, we also, in addition to Let My Doctors Decide, have this national coalition of autoimmune patient groups, the National Lupus Foundation, others that, that you work with very closely. We are all together in, in this campaign in this battle. I wish it were less of a battle, but I'm optimistic to think that if we just stay engaged and keep helping people see that at the end of the day, these are smarter decisions. If they speak to a patient's health, where that patient is, um, and not try to run them through a one size fits all bureaucratic process that ultimately seems more designed to either make someone money or save someone money than patient health, um, that we're going to make progress. And I just thank you. Thank you for your time today. And I really look forward to being shoulder to shoulder with you um, as we go forward. And I think there are good things ahead for our patients. Thank you so much. And once again, appreciate everything you do.